أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وصلاة الله وسلم على أشرف الأنبياء وإمام المسلين سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه ولا كل من يحترى أما بعد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أبيز يزيد تو الله the creator of the heaven and the earth who has made our classes uh, a very fruitful one and have really benefited a lot from the class. May Allah bless our instructors and the academy and the Muslim Ummah as a whole. Inshallah, today I will be presenting my topic for the class and the topic of my presentation is Muslims and the World Civilization, an overview of uh, George Sutton's books. And that is Introduction to the History of Science. So my name is Kazi Maki Malainka. This is my matric number. And the name of the course is Islamic Civilization in World History been taken between the trimester of February and May 2003 at the IK Academy, Georgia. And that is a postgraduate certificate in Islamic thought and a integration of knowledge. Now, so the background to my discussion is taken from two different books by two different authors between two different times with 40 years or more apart and the issues or issue that has been raised still lingers um, as a result i feel let me explore a very little aspect of it and that has to do with with a book that is written in 19 between 1927 and uh, 1948 by one of the great uh, scholars of uh, sciences particularly history of sciences so the first statement from the first scholar is for almost a century before Saturn completed his introduction, that is the name of the book in short form, several Orientalists and Arabists had been producing monumental works on the Islamic Arabic legacy. But Saturn's contribution regarding the place and relevance of this uh, civilization, that is Arabic Islamic legacy, its history of science and technology and its universal impact remains unique. The author is referring to the Islamic Arabic legacy in terms of sciences and civilization. He continues, he said, Saturn's became a worthy successor to these pioneers and scholars, and that is the Orientalists and Arabists that have written earlier before him. However, this author maintain a very strong position, which I shall be discussing in full in a short while. He said, Saturn was the first and most dynamic among them to give a prominent place to Arabic, Islamic science and technology. The author claimed, and it is actually founded in a, it, it's actually available in, in this journal, as it did in its, uh, Saturn's first journal. This is uh, Isis, not Isis that we know. It is Isis, and it is the name of a journal which I'll be speaking a bit about also in a while. So this claim that Saturn was the first and most dynamic among the uh, several Orientalists and Arabists that have written before him will also be found in these different journals 
and the book I was talking about, that is introduction to the history of science and Saturn's other publication for over 40 decades of prolific life. So in the view of this author, he said, the Arabic Islamic legacy that are recorded by Saturn's, which shows the contribution of the Muslims during the period go beyond mere transmission of an ancient and classical legacy leading to new significant observations, conclusions, and ideas. Over 40 years later, another scholar made a very close statement. So according to this scholar, that is Sarda, in a, a book that I stumbled on, I should say I was fortunate to read uh, late last year, and particularly as a result of my participation in one of the last trimester classes, that is Islamic epistemology. So in the, the name of the book is actually Imagine Epistemology. You can check it out. So this scholar, that is Sarda, said, according to Jatons, uh, George Saturn's monumental introduction to the history of science, which has not been equaled in recent times, Muslim scientists and scholars shaped and advanced science from the 8th century AD up to the end of 15th century AD. So based on these two statements, I want to explore certain aspects of the book. And as a result, like I claim here, against this background of the above statement, this presentation aims to provide a brief overview of Saturn's scholarly survey of the history of science. The presentation focuses on Saturn's discussion of the major contributions by the Muslims to the world's civilizational development. This is attempted through a textual analysis of one of the major works by Saturn. And I focus particularly on the session that discusses certain Muslim scholars during, during the medieval period. Of particular interest is how their achievements in the field of knowledge and science have shaped and influenced our modern world. Some of Saturn's efforts to achieve this is highlighted. His orientation on essence and nature of knowledge as an integrated and cumulative reality of human understanding of the world is also discussed. Equally, the essence of this presentation lies in its main purpose to demonstrate how a non-Muslim objectively and scholarly presented the contribution of the earlier generation of the Muslims to the growth of knowledge and how this continues to benefit mankind in terms of knowledge production, scientific discoveries, and creative invention that characterize the modern times. So my talking points are the following. I will make a very brief biographical sketch about Saturn's life. And I will be focusing on two things or three things. The first one I will focus on is a very brief about his life, his education, his early life rather, his education, and academic and intellectual contributions. The next point will be a brief point on Saturn's classical book, and that is the introduction to the history of science. Next, I will focus squarely on Muslims' contribution to the modern sciences and civilization as discussed by Saturn's scholarly survey. So and lastly, I will make some lessons as a contribution and recommendation of my uh, in my presentation. So the next slide, which so shows some biographical sketch about uh, uh, Saturn is here. So John Alfred Leon Saturn is the full name. He lived between 1884 and 1956. He was born in Germany, in Belgium rather, his mother died after a year of his birth. 
and he had all his uh, education in his country. Initially, he enrolled for philosophy, actually, but along the line, due to some interest, he changed to pursue his uh, interest in natural sciences. He has his PhD in mathematics, and, and that was in 1911. With uh, his thesis was on Celestia, Celestia Meknis, and got he got married in 1911 as well. Let me expand this. It seems to be okay. Uh -huh. So he spent his career with family in the United States since 1915. 1915. So he worked as an academician, academician in the University of Illinois, Harvard University, Teachers College at Columbia in these three uh, academic places. So he founded in 1912 the International Quarterly Journal, and that is ISIS, which I mentioned earlier, which centers centered around the discussion of sciences, particularly historical development of uh, uh, scientific discoveries and invention and the likes and the major figures in the areas. So he founded a second journal in 1936, which is called Osiris. It was equally devoted to the history and philosophy of science. So these two journals and every other activities he was able to get himself engaged with during this period in his life, later uh, led to the formation of an independent discipline that came to be known and still known as history of science. So the following are a few of his works, the history of science, the history of science and the new humanism, the study of the history of mathematics and the study of the history of science. And you can see he always uh, centered his uh, focus of study and pursuit around history of science, history of science. So the last one here is a history of science. Another one is ancient history through the golden age of Greece, which was published by uh, Harvard University. Massachusetts and Cambridge. Okay, let's proceed. Here is brief points on Saturn's classical book. So I will be pointing out some key issues so briefly on Saturn's uh, introduction to the history of science. So the objective of the book, according to Saturn himself, was to enable scholars to know as exactly as possible the state of knowledge at the time for each topic related to sciences. He initially aimed to write up to nine exhaustive uh, uh, volumes history of science, but he was only able to achieve three volumes due to the enormous nature of the project, he got inspiration to pursue this uh, 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 study and this book rather from the study of Lino da Vinci, but he had not reached da Vinci period in this work before he passed away. So he however had one series of lectures entitled Science and Civilization in the Time of Lino da Vinci, that is scientist an artist, and that was in 1957. So the efforts that was put up in order to have this book uh, written was very great. And as a result, I'm highlighting a few of them here. So volume one took nine years of preparation. The second volume and its publication took 13 years of preparations, while the third volume took 27 years for completion. So between 1927 and 1948, that was when he was able to achieve three volume out of the nine projected exhausted volumes. So as a result, he could not carry on, like I said earlier, to, due to the unexpected uh, enormous nature of 
the whole thing. So the the method he employed, basically throughout the book, is analytical and synthetic investigation with certain uh, historical approach as usual and uh, as expected as well. So brief point on Saturn's work continues. An overview of the book is here. So the name of the book is the history of science from Homa through the 14th century. So the three volumes come in five parts with a total page of 4,296. So the first volume, which is in one part, one part covers from Homa. This is an, a very popular figure in ancient Greek long time, very long time ago, to Umar Khayyam. This is a scholar, Muslim scholar that lived uh, towards the end of the, say, 14th century AD. So he tried to cover some of the scientific discovery that took place between this very long time of Homer in the ancient Greek before, before Christ up to this point. And this is where the focus of today's presentation lies, and we shall be looking at it in some full details. So the second volume has two parts, and it covers the period of a great scholar known as Rabbi Ben Ezra, a Christian, a Jew a scientist, up to the point of Rogers Bacon. This is a very a known scholar during the Enlightenment period. And the last volume, which is the third uh, volume, has two parts as well, and it deals with science and learning in the 14th century. So we are not going into this. So one thing that needs to be noted about this three volume is that it started covering various scientific discoveries and civilizational uh, invention and uh, the likes right from a very long period up to the 14th century. So and during this period, he tried to see the key figures and their major inventions and discovery. So it was within this time that he discovered that the Arab Islamic legacy played a great role in the emergence of the Enlightenment period, which we are going to be discussing a little about in a short while. So, so the work contained the first tolerably complete accounts of medieval science and, te and technology. And it also integrated Eastern and Western cumulative knowledge into a single synthesis. And this is one of the key uh, 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 paradigm which Saturn's pursue through, throughout his major uh, uh, works. So the next slide, this is contribution to the modern sciences, Muslim contribution, I think. Yeah. So Muslims' contribution, contributions to the modern sciences and civilization based on Saturn scholarly survey. So following a series of studies on history of scientific development right from the ancient Greek, Saturn turned to the 18th century AD. And from this time on, up to 14th century, he tries to see the, the, the influence, the participation, the efforts, and the, 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 the inputs that was coming from the Arabic Islamic legacies. So based on his investigation on, on the period that covered the time spanning between 8th century to the end of 15th century, Saturn assigns each half century to at least a dominant intellectual personality and equally devotes a whole chapter to discuss every discovered or discovery that is made between that time and the findings that he was able to uh, 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 discover himself. So with this, he was able to show through concrete historical facts that for consecutive 800 years, there will always be at least 
let's note this. At least a Muslim scholar that will rose to prominence by eventful scientific discovery, discoveries or inventions that became integral part of subsequent knowledge growth and civilizational development. So Saturn discovered during the course of his study and therefore believed that he believed that the Islamic contribution to science was the most progressive element in medieval learning and was outraged when Western medieval studies ignored it because of their orientalist agenda. So as a result, the following was discussed in his book. The first one, he discovered the second half of the 8th century is the time of Jabir ibn Hayyan, which was the father of modern day chemistry, 19th and 10th, 10th centuries are the times of four great scholars, and that is Al Khawarizmi, who invented the uh, 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 mathematical concept of algebra, as well as Arozi, who infused medicine with clinical precision. Al Masudi, the geographer who produced a map of the world towards the end of the 10th century. And the last one during these two centuries is Abdul, Abdul Wafa, the astronomer and mathematician who, who produced accurate trigonometry tables that continue to be used in solving mathematical uh, problems. So the first half of the 11th century is the time of another two Muslim scholars, and that is Al Haytham, who was the father of uh, modern day optics, Al Biruni, the polymath who measured the latitude and longitude of the heart. So, in the second half of the 11th century, there was the Omar Khayyam, who, who, was, the, who was a great mathematician who solved equations of third degree. This, all these are some of the survey. I'm only giving some brief uh, discussion about them that is presented in a, a Saturn's uh, book. So by 12th century, Western science begins to rise up, but not without Muslim tutelage. So before this time, that is almost up to 400 years, Muslim dominated the civilizational scene completely that at every point in the time during 18th and 15th century there will always be at least a muslim that will rise to prominence with regard and respect to an eventful discovery that is related to science and civilization in general so after from 12th century onward, begin to have Muslims along with other non-Muslims who are really doing very great things in the field of science and civilization in general. So as a result, we have one Muslim along with two non-Muslims in the 12th century who rose to prominence in each of halves of the 12th century. So in the first half of the 12th century, we have Ibn Zuhud, who perfected surgical and post motim techniques. So Williams of Conchis and Abraham Ibn Ezra, that I mentioned earlier, were the two non-Muslims who shared the timeline with Ibn Zuhud. So like what we always had before now, whereby we have Muslim dominating completely. So in this case, we begin to have Muslims along, alongside non-Muslims. And one thing that is pathetic in court is that we begin to have more of the non-Muslim coming up alongside, alongside the Muslims. So following the 12th century, uh, the first half of the first century, we have Ibn Rushdi the highly celebrated rationalist philosopher, together with another two non-Muslim again, and that is Gerard of uh, 
Cremona and Memonides, this popular uh, uh, philosopher and scientist. So next is the half of the 13th century, where we have Ibn Baytar, they are featured here as great botanists, uh, botan uh, botanists that provided a great encyclopedia of uh, medicinal plants with a botanical compilation. He shared this period, that is the first half of the 13th century, with two non Muslims, that is Robert and Jacob as well. So, following this, and that will be the second half of the 13th century, we have Kutubuddin Ashirazi. He not only gave the first correct explanation of the formation of the rainbow, but also continued the work of Aitham that we mentioned earlier. As usual, he also had with him two Christians, two non-Muslims, let me put it like that, and that is Roger Beacon that I mentioned earlier as well, and Jacob Ibn Tabon. So for last century, that is for the last century, as discussed by uh, Saturn's in Saturn in his book, we had, and that would be 14th century, we had Abu Alfida, the astronomer and chronicler of human history. He shares the first part of the 14th century as usual with Levy and Williams of Ockham. This is a very popular philosopher as well. So the seemingly last one with the seemingly last century was with Ibn Khaldun in the second half of the 14th century. Ibn Khaldun was a renowned historian and father of modern day sociology. So Geoffrey Chaucer and Hasdai shared the time with Ibn Khaldun, as uh, also well noted by the book I said I read earlier, and that is the Imagine Epistemology. So the foregoing does not mean, according to Sarda, that science and knowledge vanquished in the Muslim civilization at the end of the 15th century. These have been extensively demonstrated by many other historians of science, like George in 1944, like Jan and uh, Abdul Hamid in 2003, as well as this author in 2002. So Muslim contribution as a real-time evidence to the fact that Muslim provided necessary leverage, necessary leverage to the growth of modern science. In 2001, one of the CEOs of a popular IT company, that is HP, and her name is Kali Fiorina, made a very important statement, rightly acknowledged in public that IT technology would not have been possible without the contributions of the Muslim, particularly the most influential mathematician of all time. And she mentioned Muhammad al-Khawarizmi, who invented algorithm, a branch of a mathematics. He also invented algebra, like I noted earlier, which takes its name from the title of his book that was, that was a standard text in Europe for over 400 years, over 400 years. So all these are showing very clearly that Muslim has actually uh, uh, provided a very great leverage for the development of modern sciences. And this is more clearly uh, 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 pointed out by a, a non-Muslim of our own time. And in fact, this statement was made during the 9-11 situation in United States. So this is the link to the, to the speech. You can check it out. And in fact, he faced a lot of criticism as I, was, as I later discovered, trying to see what was the reaction of the Western world to her statement in public. So you face a lot of uh, uh, castigation and the likes, but that is another, another issue for another time. So, in order not to waste our time, so I will be pointing out these six or seven uh, 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 
blessings and a combination together. So the first one is the widely celebrated enlightenment science was directly influenced by Muslim civilization without in any way, we are not in any way denying that Muslim game fully benefited from the earlier civilization that preceded uh, uh, the, the Muslims. Another one here is scholarly work is not a small feat like many other great achievements of life. So acquiring the necessary tool, even when not easy. So he, he, Saturn made a very great effort in order to study and uh, investigate the, the, the inputs of the Muslim like every other civilization and individual in order to be able to provide the, the monu mon monumental work that this presentation is uh, briefly discussing about. So another one is set a goal as a recommendation for me and uh, myself and everyone listening to me. So we need to set a great goal and objective, even when we know that you could not achieve all in the end. And that is very better. So because the, the magnitude of the production that we make, we need to come in out in a big time with all we have in order to achieve our projection. So the truth is always there, but will only be known when you have interest and sincerity, and you also make correct efforts to find out the truth. So the truth is always there, and it could be found by anybody that, that, ha, that anybody that has interest, and not only interest, but correct and right effort. So the another one here is there is still many issues to be covered and achieved intellectually. So docility that is always observed by the Muslim has never yielded anything, and it will not yield anything. So as Muslims, others are known to take charge in writing our history for us. And this may always come with some biases against us, but Saturn seems to be one of the few ones that will show high level of objectivity and scholarly investigation in order to be able to present facts about issues the way they were really discovered. So knowledge is, built, is a built-on process. So anything we call knowledge is a built-on process, an activity. So no one has the monopoly to it. And as a result, without denying their impact, culture, nationality, religion, and race. So knowledge is not culture dependent. It is not also nationality dependent. It is not also religious dependent and equally is not race dependent. So, and I think with this, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank for your attention. Jazakumullahu khairan.